Um, oh man, it's been tough. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Rose. Hi. Rose, where are you from originally? I'm born and raised in Los Angeles, California. Tell me about your, your family. Well, I am the second child of my mother's, only child of my dad's. They both work in the television industry when they were working, and I guess that's how they met. And uh, they both had an, uh, a penchant for loving cocaine, so that kind of formed like Voltron, you know? So that's what they did, and um, my mom had a son prior to me from her first husband early on. He was 11 years older than me, my brother is. And, um, and then my, I'm my mom and dad's only child. Yeah. And they divorced. They separated when I was four. Mm. Um, among some really intense fighting from what I can recall. Like I have, it's weird how you can remember like certain core memories that aren't even that significant in nature, but they just are kind of etched into your even at a young age. Yeah. Oh, my God. You wouldn't even. People say you can't remember things like that far back. I remember things, certain traumatic events from like age of three, mm. honestly. Um, but we'll get to that, I guess. How would you describe your childhood in general? Tra traumatic. Um, I didn't really have much of a childhood because I had to. I was sexualized very early on. And I had to kind of um, grow up too fast. Who, who did that to you? My maternal grandfather and my mom's other child, my half brother. Yeah. Kind of changes your life forever, doesn't it? <sighs> yeah. It took me a, a long, long time. I'm, I'm 43. Um, it took me a long time to kind of, um, God, it's such a crazy story, dude. It's so crazy of how it all happened. But okay, so my mom's son is 11 years older than me. And um, he started touching me when I was three. And so did, I think the first person to touch me though was my mom's dad, my grandfather. He was a fucking wicked man, just evil, wicked. Um, and I, I remember it so vividly. It was Easter Sunday. I, I was wearing my Easter dress. I remember it clear as day. I don't know how I remember something so early on, but look, I, I fell asleep on their couch after like an, hunting for eggs or something. And uh, I woke up to being touched. And I just kind of didn't really, I kept my eyes shut because I was really scared, I remember. And um, I don't really remember too many like of the episodes after that from that early on, but that one kind of stuck out in my brain. Um, and, you know, it's weird. Unbeknownst to each other, my brother also started touching me around the same time, you know? So it was kind of simultaneous in nature, but unbeknownst to each other. And I honestly believe that my grandfather touched my brother too, because it's a, it's a learned behavior. You know what I mean? Like you don't just go out and start molesting unless, I mean, I'm sure maybe somebody does, but like not usually, it's usually learned behavior. Um, so I feel like that's why it was a lot easier for me to eventually forgive my brother. Or it runs in the family. Yeah, not, yeah, well that stopped with me. Um, but yeah, so yeah, that my childhood was, you know, really rather traumatic, pepper with with some really fun, cool stuff peppered in. What kind and of teenager I, were you? I was a nightmare. <laughs> I was a nightmare. I went to six different high schools, um, three of which were in the valley, and then um, two on the west side, three on the west side, and. In the end, because I'd gone to so many schools and messed up my transcript so much, uh, like a week before actual graduation, 
they told me that I didn't have enough credits and I was just like, fuck this. At that point, I was already going to raves. It was like the late 90s. I was like, I'm going to the desert in the middle of nowhere with people that I don't know and having a great time instead. So, and I was a nanny, so I didn't even really worry about any of that. Like, I didn't care if I had a high school diploma. Yeah, they asked, but like, they're not really checking. You know, like if I have a diploma, it doesn't really matter. Do you vibe with the kid? Are you a safe person? You know, um, I'm really good with kids. It's kind of weird. Like they all love me. Do you have kids of your own? I have one son. He's 14. He's amazing. Um, you were there to raise him? Yes. Um, I've been there you know, since he was born. And the only time that I wasn't was when I was pretty messed up and being making selfish choices. You know what I mean? Um, choosing, you know, substance use above him or a guy above, or love, love. You know what I mean? Like, and because of that, like, I feel like I missed I missed some stuff, and when he really needed me, because um, a kid's been through it, you know. He lost his dad early on. How did he uh, lose his dad? Uh, how? What now? How did he lose his father? Oh, he uh, he. It was an overdose, an accidental overdose. Um. And uh, it was really sudden and hard to explain to him at the time. It was really close to his birthday at the time. He was there when it happened, you know, and um, having to come back from where I was at and tell him that news because they didn't want to tell him. It was just so heartbreaking because he just didn't understand. At first, he's like, okay, so all right, when am I gonna see, am I gonna see my dad again? When am I gonna see my dad again? I'm like, baby, you're not gonna see your dad again. It's really tough. It's gonna be a hard conversation to have. It is, and like, I never thought I would have to have that conversation with him. Like, I know people that have died and stuff like that, but I never thought it would hit that close to home. Um, yeah, so that's been tough. And as he's gotten older, the sadness has kind of gave way to anger and acting out. And um, me being kind of passive and weak because I have, a, you know, I feel guilty. I feel, you know, Were you using I overcompensate. As well? Were you using as well? Uh, not the same thing, no. He, was, he liked downers and I liked uppers. Yeah, I liked passants. <laughs> How long were you using? Uh, I was using for a long time and I maintained um, what I thought I maintained an addiction for 10 years with the route of ingestion that I was having it. This is crystal or crack? Crystal, I thought, I don't think they make crank anymore. Do they? No, crystal or crack. Oh, cra oh no, not crack. I've never done crack and I was so surprised when so many of my like normal friends are just like, oh yeah, I've tried crack. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? You just casually tried crack one time? Like, that's so weird. They're kind of like one or the other. If yeah, you're, like, if you're, if you're oh, uppers. crack, I just, I'm good. Um, you know, what's weird is that I never really messed with Crystal until I moved back here from Philly and um, after I had my kid, and it was like a year and a half after I had him, and a friend of mine was like, here, I'll try this. I was like, mm, okay. Seems like a really brilliant idea to just start up a new drug habit, habit at 31 years old. Mm, genius. So um, I maintained it by smoking it for a minute for a couple of years. And then um, I went to a rehab, and while I was in a rehab, one of my bunkies was like, oh, my my boyfriend's in jail, he's in there with a guy who wants a pen pal. And I was like, all right, I've never done that. I can cross that off a bucket list, you know? All right, how to jail pen pal in life, cool, checked off. Well, that kind of snowballed into, God, people, guys that are in jail know how to sweet talk girls. Like <laughs> it is just, and it is just so crazy how they're just so about you while they're in jail. Why is, and it, they so, have no why is it so easy to fall into that oh, kind of God, relationship? Oh God, and then, 
you know, oh, here I am being an idiot, idioting all over the place, like so dumb. Because they're not in the. Because they have no options. Well, but yeah, but you're. From and I'm right there. But but you're not pressured into a relationship because he's in he's in prison. Exactly. Well, that's way easier for me. It's, you know. No commitment. Stay there. Stay right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but here's the thing: is that he did get out. He, he was only in county jail. And he went to a program that was right near mine. And long story short, I left my program early. The next day, he left his program. And like two idiots in the night, we decided to join forces, form like Voltron. And uh, that led to probably the darkest, most, f I can't even say that because it's a lot of fucked up shit's happened. In my later years in life, one of the most fucked up things ever. Yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> when you were young, did you have dreams of doing something with your life? I did, but I always was kind of, um, I always felt kind of up until high school like a, like a follower and not so much a leader. Like, I really cared about everybody liking me. I was bullied a lot in school. Um, my kid has the total opposite school experience, so I'm really happy about that. Like, he's one of the more popular kids in school, and I'm just like, oh, thank God that he didn't have to go through, like, the same experience. Because it was so bad that I knew how to, like, hustle the nurse in order to get home, to, to have a fever to go home. Like, the whole... The routine was, you give me the thermometer, I have a stomach ache, they'll give you a thermometer. It's one of those flat ones. And so I knew that if I said I had to go to the bathroom, I would walk by a coffee maker. Coffee maker's hot. Press that sucker against there for just enough time, it'll read high, you can go home, right? Like, the caveat to that is, I knew the person, 99% of the time, who was going to be picking me up was going to be my grandfather, usually. So something had to be really bad f in school for me to like weigh the options and be like, mm, getting molested, staying in school and getting bullied. I'm gonna choose getting molested, probably. Like it was pretty fucked up. Um, and uh, so yeah, that's what it was. Mm. And how many years were you using? Thir Okay, yeah. So then back to that story. Sorry. I see I ADHD and I squirrel off. I'm sorry. Um, so we we met up and uh, went, decided it would be a good idea to live out of my car in Ventura. For whatever reason, that seemed like a brilliant idea. So that's why, I like, <sighs> God. Okay, so he, I swore I would never use needles, especially after my son's father died that way. But um, I let that man stick a needle in me for the first time. And it was the most amazing, worst fucking thing I've ever done in my life. I mean, yeah, that's the only way I can describe it. The most amazing, worst fucking thing you've ever done. Yeah. And it was over from there. Like, nothing makes you lose everything quicker than fucking banging meth. Like, that's just, here, just throw it in the garbage right now because you're not going to have it for very long. It's going to be gone. And my parents, thank God, rightfully so, they decided to take guardianship, temporary um, guardianship of my son. And at the time, I was really mad because I felt betrayed, but, like, they are just doing what they needed to do to protect him, you know? Like... And thank God for them, because he could have been in foster care, and if they, you know what I mean? Like, it could have been all bad. So I'm thankful for that, but it got bad before it got better. Yeah. What do you think was your lowest point? Slamming meth in the Ventura River bottom and getting the shit kicked out of me by a fucking douchebag. Like, what? what am I doing? Yeah, that was probably the lowest. Yeah, I realized like, okay, this has got to change. He almost killed me one time. Like he, out of, he would flip out out of nowhere. This was the guy from prison. 
Yeah. Yeah, that was the the pen pal bucket mm, list dude. The pen pal. Yeah. Yeah. Genius idea of mine. Um yeah, he would he would do that. He would slam meth and he would get like Charles Manson eyes, like legit Manson eyes. It was terrifying. And um he would just beat the shit out of me and I would just allow it. Like so unlike me cuz it's so not like me. It's so like if you hear the rest of like so many layers I'm not the one to put up with that shit. Like that's just, it, all my friends were just like mind boggled. What the fuck did you do? What? You let somebody hit you? Like that's crazy. Yeah, so uh, it was that and I got out when he almost killed me that night and I went straight to a rehab, my second rehab and have been, yeah. But you, you somehow climbed out of that. I did. I had to surrender, you know, I guess. I still don't get it. I don't know. People say that they get it, and, like, I don't know if anybody ever really gets it. You know, like, I think everybody still kind of questions themselves a little bit, at least, even if they have it all together. Oh, oh I you, you went to a rehab? Um, I, do, I did go to the other rehab, but what really worked for me the best was sober living. Because I had to kind of like, you know, the rehabs I went to were state. They took Medi-Cal or whatever the state insurance is. And um, when I had to start paying for my own recovery, like I had to pay to be in the sober living. And once I had to start, it came out of my pocket and stuff, I started taking it more seriously. I feel like it was kind of weird. Hmm. What's your biggest regret? Oh, jeez. Hurting people by being selfish and self-serving. Betray like betraying people's trust. Yeah. Emotionally, what kind of things have you? Like it's been a year. Twenty twenty three sucked bad. And I'm so glad to kick its mangy ass to the curb. It was horrible. Depression or? Just a lot of like, a lot of things, a lot of events happening that kind of like, was the universe being tired of gently trying to, trying to gently tell me, hey, this isn't for you. So I had to learn some painful life lessons and it, and it was hard, but growth is painful sometimes, you know, so. It is what it is. I just have to kind of roll with it. Mm. So like, okay, last year, oh my goodness. Last year I got, I was in a relationship that ended after two years because it was just so toxic. I think maybe I'm the problem. I think that might be. Um, I think I might have borderline person. I like, I'm not diagnosed with BPD, but I am diagnosed with like ADHD, uh, uh, severe depression, PTSD, and that's it, I think. Yeah, but with a, a childhood like yours, it's... I, I'm like starting to notice a lot of borderline personality disorder attributes. And that makes me a little nervous. <laughs> like, so yeah. I get a little nervous. Okay, so last year, um. I had a boyfriend and we were together for like two years. We just didn't work out, but he was super toxic and wouldn't leave the house. And the cops were called a lot. And I ended up, they ended up trying to evict me, but they did it really illegally. And I was like, no, you're not gonna go. You're not, I'm not going down without a fight. So I fought them. I fought them and I figured it out. And basically when it was time for our day in court, the lawyer last minute came up to me. and was like, okay, well, what do you want? What are your terms? And I was like, I want the same amount that that you charged me to get into this place, and I want to stay until the end of the year. And so that's, I was out at 11.30 on December 31st, and uh, got the money. But now I'm like stuck in limbo, like my kids living back with my parents, and um, you know, that's great and all, but the thought of going back there makes me gouge my eyes out, so I mostly sleep in my car. Um, and I've been looking for a two bedroom for him and I, 
but it's kind of difficult. Like I, I work in Santa Monica, so he can go to that school because of where I work, but I would like to find a place near there so I'm not driving all crazy, but it's hard, man. It's crazy hard to find a place. And they want you to make like something like five times the amount per month. Like what am I, Hugh Hefner? Like who has that kind of money? And is renting apartments, you know? Like who, I don't, I don't get it, but whatever. I'll find it. I'll make it happen. I always do. Um, yeah. So the eviction didn't go through, but it was attempted. Oh, and also my car got repossessed, but I got another one. So, hmm. yeah. What would you say is the most important lesson you've learned in your life? <sighs> always be teachable. Yeah. I'm learn how to fight fair because sometimes I still don't know how to fight fair. I, a lot of times it's like a, it's almost like an instinctual reaction of like, I'm constantly in a state of fight f or flight or, f or, or freeze, you know? So when I feel like I'm backed into a corner, I fucking, I, I fight like I'm, my life depends on it. And it doesn't always, like I don't need to fight that hard every time. And I go straight for the jugular sometimes, but I've come a long way. I used to be very antagonistic and I've come a long way. So give myself grace. All <laughs> right, Rose, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you. I'm glad you're doing better. Yeah, I'm trying. All right, thank you. Thanks. <laughs>